it's technically not one. Um, so the, the little German me goes a little bit like, ah, we're not in time. I figure it's just not nice to let you guys sit any longer or stand. <laughs> so uh, hi, it's great to see you all again. You're having a great, well, I mean, it's the first day, so um, <laughs> we'll talk about that later. <laughs> okay, um, hi. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Andy Grauchik. I am an art director at Blender Studio, and I'm here to talk about my passion and uh, most of the stuff that I do from day to day, which is lighting on films, um, which is a little bit different from you know, the normal type of lighting that you would, well, normal, the type of lighting that you would do in architectural visualization or on, on your own fun projects or even lighting for still images. Because in, in a production, you're very focused on just being one part in the whole machinery. And uh, in the end, you're contributing to a film, which is uh, a succession of images. And uh, all these images blast by so quickly that you, um, it's just really important to make every, uh, everything read that is there on the screen. And um, that's, that's a big part of it. All right, so um, to give you a little bit of context uh, where I come from, um, I, my first uh, commercial uh, paid job was actually working with Blender on Elephant Stream in 2006. Um, which was uh, the first the first open movie, and it was actually made to test. Okay, well, can you actually make a film in this Blender software? Um, which at that time, um, Blender wasn't you know so widely uh, wide, widely widely used as now. Um, so. Um, Lots of people made different little tiny animations and different things, but it was never really put together in a, in a piece or so. I'm stopping to say coherent piece because uh, you can say about Elephant Stream what you want, but <laughs> maybe not that coherent. So, um, so for Elephant Stream, it was um, like there were a lot of firsts here. Like there were like there was some technology in Blender already built in. But um, uh, Elephant Stream, for example, didn't use uh, ray tracing that much. Um, we used Blender Internal, which was uh, the, the thing that is thrown out of Blender right now. Um, and uh, the ray tracing part was only for the eyes, like the, the, the refractive part of the eyes, really. Like all the other surfaces was all good old reflection maps. Um, so. Um, yeah, the, the lighting wasn't really that thought out to begin with also. So we had many different scenes and almost every lighting scenario was self-contained within these scenes. So um, it's just uh, what it is. But it was uh, just the, 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 the foundation of everything that Blender built on. So the compositor was introduced back then. Um, so the, the motion blur is all in, done in the compositor and there was a lot of uh, post-frame adjustments in the compositor as well. Uh, I'm hoping to not forget anything. Yeah, uh, so um, the, the, the way that it's lit is also very um, uh, economical. Like I have began to uh, realize that over the years because it's, uh, it's mostly consisting out of little islands. Like the characters are mostly just in a little tiny set and uh, they're literally in the void. Like there's, there's maybe one or two smaller room sets or so, but um, it's really just the characters standing in nothing, which is super easy to light. Um, the next project was uh, Big Buck Bunny uh, in 2008. So um, in Big Buck Bunny, it was uh, more about you know, telling an actual story, story, having fun with it, uh, also introducing fur rendering. Um, Big Bug Money was actually not ray traced at all. There were like all the reflections for the eyes. We just uh, abandoned that and uh, we didn't do any, any fancy stuff. So everything that you see in Big Bug Bunny is non ray traced, shadow buffer, spotlights. Um, it made heavy use of the compositor because we had a lot of fast paced action and a lot of fast moving characters and they, uh, they had to have motion blur and we had to have depth of field. The depth of field in Elephant's Dream, for example, was only it was was done with compositing layers in Gaussian blur and stuff. And in Big Buck Bunny, we had uh, depth of field based on the actual depth information in the scene. But um, also, what that meant is that you see the character standing in grass. Uh, we had to find a way to separate the character from the grass, 
Uh, so the compositing setups for, for, for Big Buck Bunny were pretty elaborate. By today's standards, probably not. But every character was able, was, be able, was, uh, was tweakable. Like all the characters, all the, uh, all, sorry, all the characters had individual layers and we could tweak the colors of each individual character to make them uh, more saturated, more stylized, more cartoony. Um, we still had a little bit of that islanding effect going on because the sets were tiny. They were really small. Most of the time it was just a tree uh, with a little bit of a hill underneath it. And then the far background was just layers of, of textures of, of hill matte painting, basically. So still very, very economic and very doable. Um, next, uh, we had uh, Tears of Steel, or I was on Tears of Steel. So. Um, uh, didn't, unfortunately didn't take part in Sintel, but Tears of Steel was kind of different because uh, it was a VFX project and uh, all, everything that had to be rendered and lit was part of a shot that had to look realistic, more or less, um, and it had to integrate with the realistic elements in the, in the shot. So there were a lot of constraints. Um, you know how to you know how you can light something because you almost had to in every shot you had to have you had a real element that the lighting had to adapt to um, this was the first use of cycles in any real production that we did um, it came out like half a year before that um, and this was really the testing ground of everything that cycles came to be. We had a lot of issues. Uh, we noticed that it's really hard to lo uh, light interior spaces with cycles. And it's also really hard to have many different lights just by the nature of how cycles was, uh, the path tracing algorithm was in, uh, implemented back then. Um, so uh, lots of slowness going on. The, um, the motion blur was still done in the compositor. Uh, so didn't you really use cycles motion blur? I'm not even sure if we had deformation motion blur back then. Um, yeah. And, and of, as you can imagine, those little elements that we had to uh, compose together, those were also almost little islands that we could light uh, individually. After that, a uh, fun little detour um, was Caminandes uh, Grandi Lama, which was a very fun little short story. Um, and uh, this was totally different because it was very cartoony and very, uh, very, very expressive. Um, it was a very simple show because uh, it was mo mostly just one lighting scenario for everything. Um, nothing really changed except for that shot maybe, which was just one, one little shot. Um, yeah, and then the, the nighttime. But um, there was not a lot of variation in it. And you can see also, it is, it is also kind of an island. So we have the foreground, and then everything in the background is just matte painting texture. Um, motion blur, still vector blur, uh, still done in a compositor uh, as a post adjustment. Um, we tried to use motion blur, and it was really, really super slow, we, so we didn't. Um, next on was uh, Cosmos Laundromat. Um, I uh, was fortunate uh, enough to do uh, some lighting on a couple of shots and most of the time I was delegated to do the tornado because um, it had a tornado in it and some, someone had to do it. Um, so Cosmos was a little bit more ambitious because it was part of a bigger, of a bigger project. Um, it was supposed to be a full feature film and this, uh, the, this episode of it was just the beginning of the whole thing. Um, so it had to fit in that grander piece um, at the same time, it was, it was really one of the first project where we didn't have a lot of that islanding going on because we had a character in a full environment and the environment had to, um, you know, the conditions of the environment had to uh, affect the characters and they couldn't just be lit as one little piece. So it was a lot more demanding in that, um, also the number of shots. and. Of course, we had fur and, uh, and that damn tornado. So um, there was no motion blur in that film because it was really, really, really slow to render. I think, Shelte, you remember when we rendered, yeah, there was, there was one or two shots and then they just, the, the render time just exploded because, yeah, it's just really costly to do. Um, 
And uh, after that, fun little detour coming on this Lamigos, which was uh, just another completely, well, completely different thing than the one before. It was very cartoony, very fast-paced action, very, uh, you know, very, very fun. Like a lot of a lot of different scenes, three different lighting scenarios. Uh, we have the the scene at the end where it becomes uh, kind of moody and a little bit sad, and uh, it was it was very fun to to do this. Um, and the environments weren't as big as Cosmos Laundromat, so a little bit more lower budget, right? So smaller islands uh, of environment. Still, we did have some scenery stretching into the far background. There was a lot of problem with uh, render noise, like those berries that you saw that uh, I remember doing the rendering that last shot before the premiere and we had some noise on the berries and we couldn't get rid of that freaking noise on the berries. Uh, uh, lots, of, lots of fun little issues like that. Um, next up, uh, Agent, Operation Barbershop. Slightly different again. Um, this time it was all interior lighting. So, um, uh, we had exterior, we had the outside, we had the inside of the barber shop, and then we had the basement environment to light. And um, this was kind of a deviation from, from everything. Like, except for Cosmos and, and Tears of Steel, everything was very cartoony and very stylized. The lighting was very bright, and uh, you know, you had to really focus uh, uh, on the character and uh, getting that appeal right. On the agent, it was all driven by cinematography and by the practical lighting situation in the set. So um, we had to do two things. The characters had to look good, but at the same time, everything had to be very grounded, very physical, because uh, you see those lights there, they had, to, they had to have an effect on the character, and we placed them in a way that uh, in every shot of the whole thing, we could kind of cheat a situation where there would, there would be interesting, appealing lighting. Uh, going on. Great project. First film that we actually used motion blur and cycles in. So that was great because uh, Sergei um, Sheribin, he made sure that we can actually render shots with, uh, with motion blur without waiting 10 days. <clears throat> uh, let me just check my notes. I'm just going to uh, give a little rundown of this and then we're going to do a practical demo right away. Um, um, mostly using the, the, the shots in Sprite Fright. Um, there was spring, which was, uh, which was more bigger environment. We had lots of, you know, the, lots of sets stretching far into the distance and the characters had to be uh, seemingly part of it and they had to be integrated into it. Um, at the same time, we had volume rendering, we had fur and everything just had to be, um, yeah, bad, Bad word to describe it, but earthy. Everything had to feel tangible. The lighting had to feel like it was natural, like it was outside, and uh, and you just you had to feel the the elements of you know of the scenes. Um, sorry, I don't want to forget anything. Smoke is noisy. Yeah, of course. I don't know why I wrote that down. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so coming back to that islanding effect, uh, just, just to say, is that this project uh, had a little bit of that going on because we had sets that were made in such a way that you can, like, you can only see so far, but, um, but you still had a lot of expansive environment. So uh, very, uh, very tricky and a little bit costly to light that kind of stuff. Um, this project, we also did uh, denoising in, uh, in post because we rendered everything in, uh, in multi-layer OpenEXR with passes, cryptomat, and everything, and then we, uh, we piped it through the compositor to denoise it, which was back then uh, still a new thing. Uh, now uh, we can all do it, and it's fun. Um, so let's, uh, let's come to this project that we're talking about today. Uh, Sprite Fright was uh, a little bit of everything. Um, and it was also kind of ambitious because it was one of those productions, was one of the most complicated production we, we, we tackled up to this point. We had lots of characters, we had effects, we had variations for those characters, so they had to go through different stages and of wear and tear. Um, and uh, the whole story was centered around the characters. At the same time, they, uh, it all 
played in a very, you know, in a forest set. The forest had to have a character. And Matthew, uh, uh, Matthew Lund, the uh, uh, director, and Ricky Nierva, the production designer, they wanted this forest to feel like a real forest. Um, but at the same time, the characters are stylized, the shape language of the set is stylized, the colors are stylized. Um, so we, we had to kind of slip our way into, into this and make something that, that feels right. Um, right. Uh, am I forgetting anything? Huh. Shot count. <laughs> Just to mention it, I don't know why I wrote this, wrote this down, but uh, also Sprite Fight had the most shots that we had until this point. We had 227. Before that, the agent had 74, 74, and Spring had 100, roughly, or so. So this was also uh, another, another step up, uh, especially with our small team. So a lot of decisions had to be made to be able to light these shots in a, in a quick manner. Um, because we only had two people doing the lighting. It was me and it was Bo uh, who st uh, stepped in later in the process. Um, so we had to divide the movie into those shots and make sure that we find uh, a way to describe how we do the lighting because not everyone can just, you know, you can't just make it up as you go. You have to make up the language so you can, uh, you can make a result that is coherent at the end. Um, so let's, let's talk about how that uh, came to be. So in Sprite Fright, it's very, um, it's very much based around the, the idea of chunkiness. Um, we're going to talk about that also in our uh, Sprite Fright presentation tomorrow. But um, it's all supposed to feel a little bit more like a model. Not that we're trying to emulate the look of models you know, with fingerprints and that kind of stuff but we want to make it look like a, like a little toy world because Matthew, uh, he grew up in a, uh, in a family, in a tradition. Um, they owned a to toy store, so he really wanted to have that kind of feel and that kind of appeal. Um, and that meant that uh, the lighting had to support that. Um, and we also decided that it would be good for all the props and everything that we have. We have a very uh, medium to low local contrast. So within the like within those colors, there is there is bump, there is a little bit of variation, but it's not too contrasty. That's what it, uh, what it means. So uh, you see this object, and you can tell what it is. And if you look really close, you can see the detail, but uh, the overall shape uh, and the secondary detail that's what uh, that's what's count. That is what counts. Um, then we had a. Uh, to make that make it easier, we had to uh, we introduced a limited color palette, which was actually um, a, a, a thing that uh, Vivian, our concept artist, uh, advocated for very early on, and I'm so happy that we we made it work in the whole film. Um, what that means is that uh, we don't use you know ten different types of green. We use maybe use two to three different types of green, um, and the characters have uh, colors shared among them, and the hues are shared. So if you see everything on the, fine, on the screen, it all comes together and it's not too, too noisy. Same goes for the environment. We, uh, we try to make sure that you don't have too many different bark textures or too many different colors of bark. The green is uh, one shade. The ground is, one, is the same kind of brown. And the mushrooms are the same kind of red. So it's all, it all looks like it comes together in the get-go. You don't have to do any of that in grading. And what, what that hel um, helps you with is making the characters stand out more because they're, they're really the story is about the characters. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so uh, it's about the characters. So the most important thing is uh, appeal for us. And uh, you can do, like you can do, do crazy things with naturalistic lighting. You can make a forest with, you know, with uh, fog and depth and dewdrops and elements and everything, but at the uh, end of the day, it's a, it's a distraction. It's just there to look hyper-realistic, to look beautiful. Um, that was more um, spring. Spring was more of that. For Sprite Fright, we, we wanted to have the, char 
characters uh, you know, tell the story and be the central point without making it seem like the background is too simple. So appeal was very important for us and uh, making the characters dimensional was already also very important to us because the, the shapes were all very stylized and beautiful. Like you have these uh, very nice sculptures almost and our job as lighters is to make sculptures that are in motion look great essentially. So, um, so the language that we used for, for lighting these was very simple. It's almost going back to the original uh, metaphor of three-point lighting. But um, the most important thing is, is the gradients. The gradients along the faces, the, the topography of how, you know, how those volumes look on the screen. Um, so we had a shadow area, um, which is also the balance. So the environment world, that's the color there. Then we have highlights and we have a rim, just three different elements. And you can play around with these three different elements. Again, that was made because we had to light 227 shots in a very sh uh, short period of time. Um, and within that, you can already do a lot of things. For example, um, if you have a night shot, um, you can, uh, for example, you see, you see the rim is on the side of the highlights here. Um, during the day shots, that was extremely important. Um, also to make the scenery not look too fake. Um, in the night shots, sometimes the rim is on the back side. So it's like highlights, shadow bones, and then the rim is on the other side um, to help the characters separate from the backgrounds. Um, and that depends on the, on the scene, of course, because sometimes you have a scene that is in backlight, so the rim becomes the most important light source of the whole thing but uh, you still want to have that appeal and the softness in, and the, the nice gradients in the face, so you need to have some kind of faked key-like key -like in the face um, to, you know, to, to make the character read. Um, so appeal and dimensionality is, was very important for us. Um, then value separation was also very important because we did have a very busy background. We had lots of leaves and lots of stuff going on um, we try to separate by value as much as possible the characters. So in almost every shot, there is a clear separation between foreground and background by value. Um, value is you know, when you uh, desaturate your whole image. That's what you get. That's what your brain actually perceives uh, when they first look at this frame. Um, your, your brain just registers all the values and then all the, co uh, the colors next. Um, so we try to make sure that the action always happens in the areas of biggest contrast. Suddenly it became very quiet. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm hoping I'm not boring you guys uh, with like lots of repeated information. I, uh, um, I'm going to step into the, the practical demonstration very soon. Um, then we try to do focus, uh, getting focus through light vignetting. Um, and a vignette, vignette, you guys probably know, is, is most of the time is a post effect. But um, in order to make, it, make this whole movie look more like a, like a staged model world, um, we try to make it look kind of staged in the lighting as well. So that vignetting um, is mostly done in the lighting. So the center of the shot can be lit and the edges would be, carefully, uh, would be carefully masked, so you have a little bit of a fall off there. Um, and this was also like first appeal, softness, and to make it look like a, you know, like a little tiny model world that we can do, go into. Um, this is a little bit of a, um, of a compromise, because um, this was more of a, a rendering, uh, you, know, a thought, you know, trying to make the rendering as manageable as possible. Um, on Agent 3 to 7, we had a lot of highly re uh, reflective objects, and that caused a lot of noise, and that caused a lot of render time. And also, those objects, when they twinkle around in the background, they are very distracting. So what we decided that is that we would limit the amount of reflective objects and tiny, busy, specular highlights to the eyes, which are the most important thing in the scene. You're looking at the eyes of the characters. And then maybe those objects that are really important that we see that they are metal. So the barbecue, you see, has a little bit of metal parts, but it's not too, uh, too reflective. It's very, very dull, kind of. Um, 
yeah. Okay, so um, tools to make the job easier. Um, again, 227 shots. So um, there are some things that you can do along the way, uh, when, also when you're lighting on your own project or on, on a similar show, um, is to, to make this all easier because um, you're not, you're not, you, know, you just don't, you don't get 200 shots at once and then you have to deal with it one by one and you start just picking away at the, the mountain with a toothpick. Um, you have to find a way to make it, uh, you know, to organize yourself. So these are the tools that we had at our disposal or that we came up with um, that make things easier. Um, well, hard to come up with this. Um, it's very vital, I would say, but I, uh, I just mentioned it here. It's very good to have a shot list and have tracking for your shots. Um, if you have to do 100 shots in two months or 10 shots a week or so, it's, uh, very, it can be very daunting if you don't see uh, the shots within the big picture. And uh, of course you need the tracking part of it to make sure that you know what you're currently doing because you might not be doing one, uh, one thing at a time. You might be doing 20 things at a time. Um, so this is really helpful and this was really a very helpful tool. Um, the first thing when I go into a project is to ask, okay, where are the shots? How many shots do we have? How many, which are the complicated shots? Which are the easiest shots? Um, then having production art is a bit of a no-brainer, but if you have really great inspiring production art, uh, it's, it's very easy because you have inspiration, it's all there, and uh, even though you might not have to emulate it right away, um, you have something as a basis, as a starting point, because it gets people on the same page, they can talk about it, and, uh, and you, then you can compare your, uh, your, your task to that artwork, uh, and you have something to talk about, which is incredibly helpful. Color script, really, really helpful. We didn't do it for many of the project, projects that we had, um, mostly because of the lack of good art talent, but it's, um, it's vital to have uh, an idea how the movie looked like, even at a small scale or so, even if it's just little thumbnails. Um, and even if they're just the starting point, again, of the conversation, but um, it's, it's very, very helpful because then you can look at this and you can, uh, you can evaluate it all in one piece. You're not looking at shots in a sequence, you're looking at, a, at the big picture, which uh, you can make uh, good decisions with. Such as, for example, the direction of light, um, which I think brings me to the next one. Yes, direction of light is very important for continuity, especially if you have a short film where stuff happens really fast. Sprite Fight was like seven minutes? Yeah, seven minutes. Everything happens really, really super quick. So, um, so within, that, uh, within that seven minutes, we, we are going through different shots, different environments, different lighting conditions. And uh, even though it's not completely um, obvious to the viewer at every point, our brain has to understand where we are in this place, where we are in this forest. So um, one great thing that Chiaiti uh, made in the beginning, um, before even doing the layout, was a kind of location breakdown. And this was really helpful for me because in the beginning we had, um, we, well, we knew the movie would take place at three different uh, light conditions. So there was the afternoon in the beginning, which became more of a midday thing at the end. Um, and then there was the, the, the scary uh, night stuff. Um, peeking at the ritual scene with the fire. And then there was the ending, which was morning. And that graduation between night and uh, morning also happened within a number of shots. So um, it was very important to know where the sun is because the sun tells you where you are uh, in relation to the environment. Um, and then if you, have a, if you have a set where you're filming things at a different position or so, you need to absolutely nail that sun position um, to know where you are and not confuse people. Um, it's not so clear cut all the time because like there is a lot of leeway into how you're, uh, you're positioning the sun. Like around 30 degrees, you can play around with it, uh, cheat things in backlight or, uh, or do it more frontal or so. There's, there's ways to, to cheat around that, but at the same time, yeah, it's, it's good to have a good basis and to know where you are and where the sun is 
or the strongest light source in your scene. Um, yeah, I mentioned that, uh, breaking it all down into different scenarios, little building blocks uh, makes it all uh, more manageable. Um, in Sprite Fright, we had three different ones. We had day, night, and morning, as I mentioned. And uh, these had fixed colors already. So we decided that we would use this color palette within this, uh, this lighting scenario and this within this other scenario. And there was not a lot of, uh, a lot of intersection going on. Um, color val uh, value library was very important for that because um, same as for the lights, we also did that for the characters themselves. We made a library an actual blend file with nodes in it and those color values. And those color values, values were used in all the props and all the characters. Um, and uh, we had this, a similar one for the, for the lighting. And so that means if we change one color in the library, um, it would propagate to the entire film. And um, we could just you know, make decisions based on one shots because all the, value, the color values were all the same. Um, yeah. This is the one thing I, I mentioned. I'm gonna go into that in the live demo as well. But we had, we basically had libraries for, um, you know, which are just node groups with uh, RGB nodes. It's very simple if you think about it. Um, it's not a lot of work. You just have a file that's centrally and you uh, locate it and you, uh, you're linking in those nodes into your scenes. And that way you make sure that all the key lights, all the fill lights and all the, everything has the same color. And if you just change that node in your central location, you're propagating it to the entire film. All you have to do is re-render everything, which makes it very manageable. Um, yeah. If you want to deviate between that, you can do that. Um, we did that in, I don't know, in some, some occasions or so. And at, uh, if you want to deviate from that slightly, you can just put a hue saturation node or uh, uh, something else at the end and then everything still happens in relation to your color values that you have set in the beginning. Um, yes, uh, stylized eye highlights was also very, was a, a decision that we made to have uh, stylized highlights. Um, more, um, I'd like to say more uh, clearly, is highlights that the animators place. Um, in many of the projects we did before, uh, except for Kaminandas, I think we did all the eye highlights with lights. So the lighting artist, Aimi, um, had to set those highlights very carefully um, in the shot. And those highlights are very important because they, uh, they make a large part of the appeal of the character. Um, and uh, if you have a highlight that's positioned wrong, you can look like your character is cross-eyed. And uh, to some people that might not look appealing or so, or it might not look like the eye direction is correct for you know, the story that you're telling within this one sh uh, shot. So in Sprite Fright, we decided to just leave that to the animator, um, not to like pass work away from us. Well, yes, maybe also, <laughs> but, um, but also to make sure that they can, because what they do on a day-to-day -day basis is control the appeal of a character in every single frame, and they're so meticulous about it, they're, they're handcrafting every single frame, it would be uh, stupid to not leave, it, to leave the highlights to them because um, they make up such a large part of appeal. However, the problem is that if you're doing that, uh, you, have a, you might have a discrepancy between the lighting that you're doing and the lighting that the animator is doing. So how we fix that is by, um, by, by making this i.cheat cheat sheet, which I made right after Hjalti gave us the location, um, the location uh, map, and after we had the color script. Um, and this cheat sheet was there to give the animators, uh, in every shot that they would animate, a little guideline to where the light would be coming from. And this was done over the course of several afternoons or so, just trying to figure out where the sun is where I would put the lights in the scene, basically lighting the whole thing in my head, um, and then uh, putting little arrows in the, into the shots, um, just as a guideline where the light is coming from. And you can see in the uh, upper side here, maybe you guys can't read this, but this was basically uh, just a little legend to tell them, okay, this is what happens if the arrow is coming from this side, then the highlight is in that part of the hemisphere, um, and vice versa, you know? Um, and never put the eye, light, uh, eye highlight below 
in, into the into the, the other like into the bottom half because then the light would be coming from below, and except for maybe one scene, we didn't want that. Um, most of the time, the light comes from either here or here. Um, looks very appealing. The little red thing here is to tell the uh, the animator that don't deviate too much from this area of re of of interest. That's really the part where you want the highlight to be. Um, that's the part that looks most appealing. <clears throat> if you put it, like if you look at the uh, rightmost one, if you do any of that, it looks wonky. Um, you can do it. I, I think I wrote down six, never do this unless you're told to do so, and even then protest. <laughs> um, so yeah, don't, don't do these things. And that worked great. Like uh, maybe sometimes I had to tell animator, hey, ha had to tell the animators, hey, did you look at the cheat sheet? And they were like, no. <laughs> and then they, they could just look at the shot and uh, figure out the highlight and it would be good. Because then the lighting uh, would also be based on this cheat sheet. And also you can see a lot of the arrows going left and right because there's a lot of shot and reverse shots. A lot of these shots were uh, very stylized in terms of light direction, um, just to make it extra clear where the camera is and where the where the uh, the characters are in relation to that camera. All right, um, I think this is one of the last ones. Uh, a little bit of a no-brainer, um, but it's very good in production if you have primary and secondary shots. Um, you are basically lighting one shot in the beginning, that's the primary shot, and then, then you can deviate a lot into those other shots. Um, sometimes that is a wide shot. So you're doing a wide shot and then your close-ups happen in that scenery in the wide shot. Great, because then you have at least the light direction figured out. Um, maybe not the lighting itself because you have to do a lot of shot adjustments or so, but at least you can, you can just copy in those lights and see what it does and then work uh, based, on, based on that. Very helpful. Also for those shots, like if you have a lot of shots and mostly, most of the time it's just coverage, it's uh, shot, reverse shot, A, Bs, and so on. So um, you can save a lot of time by just spending the time on one shot and then propagating that light into the other shots because they're telling the same story, basically. And yeah, sometimes it was li literally just shot, reverse shot. So um, doing one shot lit five others, which was great. So that's a great way of... Um, that's a great way of actually uh, slimming down everything. So those 200 shots maybe just become 100 or so, which is a lot more manageable. Um, uh, yeah, last thing I wanted to mention is not really a, a general thing, but one uh, tool that we used uh, and also developed was the lighting overrider, which is uh, a big hack. Sorry, it's a big hack um, that are working on top of you know, uh, that, that, that's, that's working on top of your, uh, our lighting files. It's basically just a thing that generates values that uh, can override anything within your scene. It's not uh, related to the override, the library override system in, uh, in Blender currently. It's just a little thing that generates a script uh, that gets run every time the shot is loaded that changes variables. Because that way we were able to adjust lots of things, like the sprite dots uh, were, uh, were basically a rig function that got overridden with, those, with the, that lighting overrider. Um, so that's not a general tool, but I just have to mention it. Uh, last thing is a contact sheet. While you're working, it's ex extremely important to see your work within a context. Um, so uh, most of the time when you're watching something in succession, like when you're watching the scene play through, you don't realize any inconsistencies. And that's just because of fatigue and your eye just trying to, your brain just trying to match everything. And in, 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 the, end of, in the end of the day, the viewer is doing that. Like there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of leeway into, you know, light uh, adjustments and, and brightness, but um, a contact sheet, which is just a page of all your shots together, um, is really helpful to make sure that things look coherent. And you can, uh, uh, you can also see, I think this is the ungraded version of, uh, of Sprite Fright. So in the middle here, you can see some shots are looking really bright. Those in grading we dimmed down, but uh, yeah, we could see immediately which shots are deviating from the lighting scheme and uh, what looked off. 
really good tool. Um, before we uh, jump into the live session, which is great, we're running great on time, I'm gonna quickly mention the rendering pipeline for this, um, just because you gotta know the technical part of it, um, at least um, on the surface level while you're doing these things. Um, the, the file setup we are using is very similar to um, the, work show, uh, the workflow that we have established over the years within our studio. Uh, we have, um, for every shot, we have three different files. We can have more, but these are the base files. We have animation file, we have lighting file, and we have the compositing file. And I think I mentioned this in a, 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 a spring pipeline presentation in 2019 or so, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail here. But basically, the lighter is working in the lighting file, the animator is working in the animation file, and later everything comes together in compositing. And that's extremely important because we're doing lighting uh, most most of the time at the same time as animation happens. Like we're doing a pre-lighting pass while the animator is doing their lighting. So we can't bump into each other. Um, so it's extremely important to, to separate these steps out so you're not stepping on each other's toes. Um, and the animation gets just linked into the lighting file. So every time the animator adjusts something, the lighting file gets the newest version. You can do this multiple ways, uh, but uh, this is how we did it. Um, Quick word on file formats. Uh, we uh, rendered everything to multi-layer uh, EXR 32-bit uh, after lighting. Of course, that's after doing uh, that's after doing test renders, which are all done in PNG or JPEG or whatever. Um, uh, those are put into the edit as MP4s. Uh, but the final rendering result is uh, multi-layer EXR 32-bit. Has several passes. We um, most of the time we chose to render denoising, then un, uh, then the, the noisy result, C depth uh, emission pass, um, cryptomat. Very important to do color adjustments on the go, uh, and then pipe that into the comp file. And the comp file would just read those uh, as an image sequence and output 16-bit EXRs because we don't need all that information uh, for the grading, which are then, at the end of the day, put into the edit, and the edit puts out 16-bit EXRs, which went to the grading. Um, for Spring, for example, we left that part out. We didn't do external grading, but for Sprite Fred, we did. Uh, we had a, 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 color, a colorist do the grading for us, um, which um, their studio output everything as 8-bit PNG for YouTube and JPEG 2000 for the DCP. All right, um, is, that, is, that, is that okay? Like, was it a little bit too dry? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I, I hope I don't lose you there. Um, <laughs> um, okay, what I'm now hoping to do is show you through the steps of lighting uh, a shot or a couple of shots, depending on how much time I have, just to, just to show you the day-to-day -day workflow. So um, you can ask questions at the end. Uh, we'll, have, uh, we'll have some time for that, hopefully. But I'll just try to go through uh, the order of things. Um, mostly how it would go through, uh, in the middle of production um, on a day-to-day -day basis, because uh, on this production I did I lit about, I think the most I did was around eight shots for us on a day, um, but that becomes 15 shots in a week sometimes, so it's not all the same. Yeah. But, but it was very much just you know do one thing, wait for the render, do the other, uh, the other thing. So it's, it's very streamlined. <clears throat> uh, okay, let's, let's check out a shot file. Let's just take this one here for Ellie. Um, this was uh, one of the splash screens. I think you can download uh, a similar version of this file. Uh, the lighting is slightly different. I, I think it's on, it's on Blender.org uh, in the splash screen archive. Um, okay, so um, quick run through the settings. Or are you guys interested in the settings, even or should I leave them out? Nah, nah, okay, I might as, well, might as well mention them. Just rendering settings are sometimes a little bit dry and a little bit boring, but it helps me at least to know um, what I'm dealing with. And most of these are conscious uh, decision at the beginning of the process through a trial and error, trying to optimize things. Um, so um, we are uh, using uh, adaptive sampling, which was a first on this project. Super great. 
cuts the, uh, the samples after a certain uh, noise pattern. Uh, so we're not spending too much time sampling nothing, something that looks already uh, fine. Um, so adaptive sampling was used, denoising, uh, open image denoise for the final image, uh, which was great, saved into the, uh, saved into the comp file as well. Um, noise threshold for rendering is slightly different. Uh, maximum samples for the test renders, we used about 100 samples to 115 samples, depending on the noisiness of the, sh of the shot. Um, in the, that's for the test renders, yeah, sorry, viewport. I think we even went below that, like 50 to 100 was already like, we spend a lot of samples on that. Most of the shots test renders rendered in like eight minutes per frame. So what that was that was great. Um, uh, for the final final sample count, I think we used from about 500 to 800 to 1,500, which is already f like a shot that has a lot of samples where stuff swims around. And we did have some shots where there was a lot of noise that caused denoising artifacts that looked yeah. Uh, those shots, uh, Simon wrote a tool for that we were able to, you know, denoise them in a magical way. Uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, most of the shots were actually fine. Like most of the nighttime shots were just done. Um, the daytime shots were the more, more tricky ones. Um, we use a very limited amount of light bounces, like three. This is really ridiculous if you're coming from ArchWiz, for example, where you use like 16 bounces and everything, uh, you know, you have one light source, 16 bounces, everything looks great. But with this, you have to output a shitload of frames uh, in a short amount of time. So we have to limit everything to three bounces, uh, maximum five, I would say, if you do a shot within a city or so. But um, three are, is really enough in a forest with a lot of, uh, with a lot of uh, shadow and depth going on in the set already. Um, and most of the bounces you're already faking within your light setup as well, um, because you're more uh, working from a perspective of a cinematography, uh, of a cinematic, you know, lighter, where you're putting bounce cards to, to emphasize a highlight or something, or you put a diffuse. Um, um, so it's, it's already, the lighting setup is very stylized and it's supposed, supposed to mimic those bounces already. Uh, no clamping, no caustics, um, fast approximation of GI, which was super cool. Um, cut down the render time to about from um, about 30% or so, 10 to 30%, depending on the shot. Um, that just replaces the uh, a certain, um, after a certain number of bounces, it just replaces everything with a tinted AO of the scene, um, which speeds up the rendering a lot. Um, it might not look as refined if you have, you know, realistic light bounces and stuff. But most of the time, again, we were faking those bounces and um, so we could get away with that. Saved a huge number of uh, samples and render time. Hair rendering, we're using 3D curves. Simplify was enabled, great. Um, that's it pretty much. So um, these are the rendering settings. Um, and we can just let this go. This is how our shot looks like. Great, it's done. Um, okay, so um, what you can see here is uh, a bunch of, uh, I hope you can see this. Can you guys dim that light in the front maybe? Is it possible? This light that's shining on the screen? No. Yes? No. Shaking your head. Okay. So um, we'll just have to imagine that everything is dark. So um, the first thing that I would uh, do is, um, is uh, figure out the conditions of the light. Um, what is the environment doing with the light of the character? Um, we have some fog beams here. They were mostly, most of the time, added uh, after the lighting was done, but I'll just leave them here um, uh, disabled. Um, then what I would do to make everything coherent is link in the world. And the world was always uh, in a central location. We had a library, we had uh, liblgt uh, templates.blend, which was uh, where we kept the lighting templates. Um, these were basically just uh, worlds. So we have one world for day and one for night. And we link it with relative path and we link it in and we take it and activate it in the scene. And there you go. You already have something to see and uh, your scene is not completely dark. You don't have to start completely from scratch. Um, this world is very simple. Um, there are two different ones. So it, what you can see here is that we have one for the camera and one, like this is the camera part. Uh, let me show you, yeah. 
like this. So this is what the camera sees, which is supposed to be kind of a, a drop-off set or so. Most of the time we try to mask that, but just in case we have a, a free spot somewhere, we would uh, pretend that this is the sky and this is the ground. Um, this is what the lighting sees, because this is what, what is used for the fast AO approximation. So this actually does a big job already because it lights everything <laughs> from above. Uh, it lights blue and everything from below. It kind of lights uh, yellow-ish, which fakes this balance that you get in the forest where, like if you have, imagine you have a, you have a canopy, you have the, the sun seeping through and you have bounce on the floor and you have that bounce in your, in your shot. Um, you know, it's just subtly illuminating every, everything that's kind of, uh, you know, above our heads. This is what this is supposed to do. Time is up. Oh. Stop in two minutes, please. <laughs> then let's do this super quick. Okay, I'm, I can do one shot. All right, let's uh, start with the um, most important thing, which is the environment. So I'll grab an area light, which is a preferred light source of mine. Um, this is um, a rectangular one. I'll just use disk areas for everything. This is uh, going to be the world. This is going to be the fill light. So what we'll do is just take that, uh, enable nodes. We have the nodes here. Uh, we can have the group. We can have the, variates, the variable for the lights and we can pipe the color of the fill light into this and it is the color of the world, kind of. Uh, we'll bring it down to two. Um, because most of the time we're just trying to emphasize the light coming from above to, uh, to ground it in the world. Um, we'll duplicate this um, and this will become our key light. Um, that is this. Uh, we've duplicated it. Uh, it's also an area light, but it'll become the key light. Um, this will be much brighter, 20. Um, key lights I try to make kind of small-ish, but not too small. We'll get to that later. Um, I'll duplicate that. And this becomes our sun. Forget me, forgive me for not naming everything. No, I have limited time. The sun is also our key light, but you can, you can see it illuminates kind of everything. Also the character. We don't want those sharp shadows, and we don't want this uh, very sharp terminator line. Uh, and also we want to make the angle kind of two degrees. It doesn't help. The character is still too much in the sunlight. We want to bring it down a little bit. Um, then we want to mask the sunlight of the character so we can light the character separately. Let's just bring it here. And this becomes uh, our shadow caster. This will get a dark material and this will not appear in the camera. Um, if I had more time now, I'm sorry, I kind of overestimated the time. Um, I would have, I would just make this look like leaves and add some gaps here and there. Um, all right, we want to focus our attention on the character so it's dark in the background a little bit, make it make a little bit more space here. Now we can see the sunlight still has an effect on the scene. It gives us uh, the feeling as if we had sunlight going through the leaves, um, but the character is still not lit. Um, so let's bring back the fill and the area. Let's bring it up here. Okay. So we're creating a soft light and mostly in film production, this would be done with a bounce card or like a soft, uh, uh, soft light source or so. And we just light the character. Um, we bring that around the character and that becomes our rim light. Um, our rim can be on the side of the sun or it can be in the shadow. This way it looks a little bit fake. It looks like uh, as if the rim is coming from a bounce that's somewhere in the scene. Um, so let's not do that. Let's just put it on the side of the key light. Um, and this uh, basically already illustrates the, the principles that I, I showed you, like the, just the three different steps. And what you're doing with this is just, you're watching out for the main appeal. The character is already animated great. The models look great. Uh, the asset department spent time making everything look cool, so everything has great shape language, and we just have to emphasize that. And if I'm not mistaken, I'm, the time is over now. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.